live. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. I am Edwin Hernandez, I am Head of Projects and um, Head of Computational Design at ShapeDiver. And um, Matthew will join us later and he is the, um, uh, one of the founders of ShapeDiver and he will be showing us um, a second part of this webinar. So as the name says, today is the uh, spring update of ShapeDiver. So we assume that uh, the majority of you know what ShapeDiver is. And uh, the agenda for today is uh, we will start by, um, by uh, explaining you the Rhino 8 support and other new plugins that uh, we have in ShapeDiver. Uh, the part two will be um, new sharing, embedding, and layout features on the platform. So we will go into, shape, into the ShapeDiver platform. The third part is advanced post-processing effects in the ShapeDiver viewer. Fourth part will be uh, our closing remarks. And at the end, we will have a Q&A. So the presentation is going to be uh, around one hour. And then afterwards, we will stay uh, maybe for half an hour more so we can, um, we can uh, answer all your questions. OK. The first thing to mention is that we have full support of Rhino 8. Um, what does that mean? The first thing that we have in Rhino 8 is improved mesh operation. So all these uh, mesh difference, mesh intersections, mesh split, they were still very, um, let's say, buggy or it's still very difficult to work with them in Rhino 7. I have a quick video here where I have this um, um, ring, uh, we have the, I have this ring shank, and I'm trying to cut through it to be able to set some gemstones in it. And as you can see, it's breaking all over the place here. There should be some cuts somewhere here and they are not appearing at all. Um, here, here you can see it even disappears in tar mesh. So Rhino 7 still needed plenty of uh, improvements in terms of mesh intersection. And when we go to Rhino 8, uh, now we have lots of uh, a way better mesh intersection. So you see it barely, you don't see any issues here. So that's a huge plus um, when it comes to mesh intersections, which is something very important for us um, when we create the models for shape diver. Uh, so that's the first thing that comes new with Rhino 8. The next part is improved offsets. So the offset component has had always uh, a few issues, um, but with uh, Rhino 8, there was a lot of improvements with that as well. So. Here we can see that we have uh, these like uh, glasses boundary, let's say, and I am going to apply um, an offset to it. And when I do that, um, the offset creates different regions where it breaks. So you can see here, of course, we end up with a very small curve section that when it collides instead of breaking, which is what was happening in Rhino 7, it is really creating two regions. The same happens here in this other example. We have uh, also this shape, which we can bring in and also splits into regions. So the offset has been improved significantly. We can see here also an example of how that was looking in Rhino 7. So you can see how it is breaking here. And the other example, we will see something similar. So it, it's really a great improvement. And uh, well, offsets are always necessary for lots of geometrical operations. So that's a big plus to have Rhino 8. Let's go to the next big plus, which is GLTF support. So for you, um, if you don't know what a GLTF is, it's like the JPEG of 3D. So basically it's becoming, becoming the standard um, format for 3D scene storage. It is a very compact um, format, which allows us to put a lot of information in it. And it is already used by many, many um, platforms, many software. Um, and uh, for example, one of the, let's say most known is Sketchfab in which we can really look for many examples and SketchUp actually allow us to download these models in GLTF format. So for example, here I downloaded um, this model. So I have, have this model, I can just come here down and lots of these models in SketchUp you can download for free. I mean, SketchUp is one of the places where you could find GLTFs. Like they have millions of models being uploaded per month. So you can really find uh, lots of things and you have some of them are paid, some of them are for free. And I can here download the GLTF or the GLB version of the models. Both of them are now supported by um, Rhino na natively, uh, by Rhino 8. So if I um, come back here, um, and we check the model here. I will drag and drop uh, that uh, file. I have it already downloaded. 
we can use drag and drop. Second. Okay, now I'm gonna um, open it. And we will see that uh, we will see that now we have the model that was a GLTF format. But the most impressive part is that the GLTF comes with all of the materials uh, also with the model. So if I go into the render view. We will see all of the materials in one second. There we go. So here we have now the model uh, in Rhino with all of the uh, materials. So this same model that we have here now is natively supported by Rhino. And of course, because it is supported by Rhino 8, then we can also import it uh, through our plugin. So in here, we have the um, import geometry component of uh, ShapeDiver. And here I have another example. So if I check this one, let me delete this one for now. We don't need it. And if we zoom it to this one, is this um, this st statue, which was which is a scan, a rough scan of it, uh, with some holes and stuff. But this was also a GLTF file that I found here. So I just imported through the, our import geometry component. And uh, with that, I did some processing to now use the next new thing that has Rhino. So we are in GLTF, and the next new thing is uh, shrink wrap. So as you saw, this mesh was a bit uh, um, problematic with some holes. It's really not ready. Let's say if I want to do something with it, let's say 3D printed or anything else, it's really not a good mesh. Um, but with shrink wrap, we can we can fix that. So if I check here, I have some some um, uh, processing that I'm doing. So I am roughly um, adding, a, like closing the holes that the mesh has. I am roughly patching it. And I'm also creating a base. Uh, as you can see, the base is a B-wrap, and the other parts are meshes, but they are like very uh, sketchy meshes. They are not clean. But that's not a problem, because even though it is not a clean mesh, our shrink wrap component will do all the work to make it a watertight clean mesh. So if I shrink wrap this, uh, we will see the, mo the result in a moment. Of course, this is a process that takes a little bit more of time to process, um, but the result is very impressive. So here it is finished. So if we check it, now we have our watertight mesh, super clean, ready to be used for, in this case, it could be a 3D print. And additionally, I can then, then download this through ShapeDiver with our download export component. So we can import a GLTF, new in Rhino 8, new feature in Rhino 8, and then we can shrink wrap it, which is a new feature of Rhino 8 as well. And then we can download it um, with our export component. This model, I have it also here already in ShapeDiver. And uh, I can import here the model. So this uh, import uh, component that you see here, this import geometry component, that is created automatically when you add this, uh, this component. So if I click on it, then I will be able to select any other uh, model um, for testing. And also here we have the export. So this export is the same one that you have here. So this one is automatically creating an export um, in our menu in ShapeDiver. OK, so um, the next thing that is new in Rhino 8 is annotations. So um, annotations is all of this section that we have here, which some of these um, components were already uh, there, but by third party plugins. So I think Pub Tools or other other plugins were already giving you this kind of um, components, but uh, well, they were not enough. And now it was implemented by the McNeil team. So it was very well implemented and uh, we also support it. So if we check here, I have a different example, which is like a wall. Um, let me display it. So it's just a simple wall. Um, and I am also adding some hatch to it. So if I zoom to this, you'll be able to see that I'm, I mean, I'm adding a hatch, I am adding a measurement, a linear dimension, and an angular dimension. So all of this is uh, from the new components of uh, Rhino 8. And we also support that through our export, um, um, download export component. So now I can go here to this model which is now in, in Shape Diver. 
and uh, export the world from here. Actually, I want to upload this model from scratch so you can see how uh, that works and how you will be able to change um, to Rhino existing. So if I have this model, I just need to come to Shape Diver, I need to come to Upload, um, and then I can browse here for the model. However, as you can see here, it says that I am in the Rhino 7 system, but now we support Rhino 8. So you need to make sure that here, uh, this is the Rhino version that you're using. If you use Rhino 6, then make sure you say Rhino 6. Otherwise, you can have compatibility reasons. In this case, we are looking for Rhino 8. So if I just click, let me go back to make it clear. If I just click here in this link, uh, it takes me automatically to this page where I can select the backend system. Of course, I, here I have many of them because of uh, internal reasons, but you will probably just see uh, Rhino 7 or Rhino 8 system. Um, so here I'm going to select one of the Rhino 8 uh, systems and click Save. Now I will be uploading to our Rhino 8 system. Additionally to that, you can see down here the list of all of the plugins that are supported by this system. So it could be that the Rhino 7 system has different plugins and the Rhino 8 system. So if you want to make sure that the plugins that you are using are supported, you can also check here to make sure that your plugin is supported. Then we can go back to Upload, Browse Model, and here I have that same model um, that I'm showing here, I am now uploading. Um, here I had it already there. Let me see if I go to my library. I had it already here prepared. And um, this is exactly what we get from the Grasshopper model. And if I export this uh, world, right now it's just a very simple world, but if I export that and I uh, drag it into, into Rhino, I'll draw in. Actually, this is not the right one. I have to go to downloads. This one is the right one. I'm gonna go open. And then here we have it. Yes, this one is very simple, but you can create all kinds of walls with this one. I will show you how to do it in a bit. But here you have all the annotations supported, all the hatches supported by our plugin. So you can start using them from now on. Um, Additionally, just a, a small thing that we uh, extended in the plugin is the nested layers. So in case you are you want to export this in 3DM format, so you know the 3DM format allows you to have uh, nested layers. So if I go to properties, uh, I think I deleted the layers before. Yeah. Um, so you can see that I have a wall and inside wall, I have three layers. So I have a layer inside a layer. So that's already supported by us. It was not supported before. Um, but you just do that by adding um, double points here. And then we have then a layer in wall and then another layer inside wall, which is called path, boundary and mesh. So you can really have your data very well organized. So that's all regarding Rhino 8 and we will move on with new plugins. Maybe a quick question, Edwin, uh, before the next part. Uh, we had a question about, because for the offsets, you talked about the improvements. Um, uh, and if you know regarding the, if it preserves the control points of, of the curves when you offset so that you can uh, have better lofts, for example, if you offset and then you loft curves. That's something mm. to be tested. Otherwise. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's something to be tested. I know that the old one didn't do it. The old one created other, I mean, when, when I wanted to preserve the control points, I will have to use the offset loose component. So this one preserves control points because it's actually offsetting by using the control points, whereas the offset it uses a different method. So I would I don't think it preserves the because of the way it behaves. I don't think it it preserves the control points. But to be honest, I haven't tested that. So to be tested, yeah. Any other question? No, all good. You can uh, move on. Okay, so now we go to new plugins uh, that we now support. So the first one, whoop, go back. The first one is Anemone. So this one is a very powerful plugin, which allow us to do loops. So loops were not um, possible before this plugin. And I mean, they were just possible inside the scripts. Now, when you do a for loop or a while loop inside a C-sharp script, inside a Python script, that was possible. But if you have, uh, if you are not a uh, C-sharp, uh, um, if you don't know how to code in C-sharp or you don't know how to code in Python, then you wouldn't be able to do loops. However, this, this uh, plugin, solves that issue. So here, it, this plugin has uh, very few components, but the main one to consider is this one called the fast loop start and fast loop end. And this one basically is gonna do a closed loop where in this example, I am starting um, uh, with a point 
and a list of angles and lengths to create a wall. So in this case, I want to position my first point uh, at uh, 35 degrees, and it has to be 2,000 of length. So I need to position the first point. Then I want to position the next point, but the next point should be at 90 degrees in respect to the previous segment, and it should be uh, 2,000. And the next one should be 135 degrees in respect to the last one as well. So as you can see, I have to always look for the previous computed loop. So that's why here is a perfect uh, way to use anemone because it will always um, give me back the previous um, result so I can continue computing through the loop. And I can right click on it and click on record data so that at the end, I end up with all of the points that are all um, being computed in respect to previous data computed in the loop to finally end up um, with uh, this polyline, which is basically the wall that I'm creating. And the rest is just simple uh, grasshopper um, mesh, grasshopper geometry creation. But uh, that really makes the life easy of doing these loops. I have another example later on that maybe is a bit simpler, but that shows the power of this um, model. Here, as the, all of this is already supported by us. So if I have it now here in, um, in Shape Diver, and I can add a 90 degrees angle wall. I can, add, I can see that that wall has to be 2,000 of length. So you can see it's also very quick. And I can see that the next one is 135 degrees in the first, in respect to the previous one, and so on and so on. And all of this is working through loops. So that's the first one. Um, the next one is PDF Plus. And for this one, I can go full screen. So PDF Plus is an alternative to um, the Squid, um, Squid, Squid plugin, uh, the Shape Diver Edition, which I have it here. Uh, this one also allows you to create PDF. So you have here the Squid PDF component, and, and, and I have a complete video tutorials in our YouTube channel where I teach how to use this plugin. However, now we have also an alternative, which is called the PDF Plus, and it works very similar to the Squid one. Um, in which I am creating uh, some instructions that need to be added into my page to uh, set up the PDF. So here, for example, I have um, I have taken the um, I have taken the dimensions of my model, the one that I was just showing, the wall. I've taken those dimensions. I have scaled them down so that they fit the page, and then with that, I extract the position of those dimensions and the text so that I can draw that into the PDF. Um, then here we have the lines of, of these uh, dimensions, and I'm also drawing that through this shape graphics component. And all of that goes into this content component that is basically uh, printing everything into our page. This content component creates one page, and then here I have a second page. And with that, I am able to create um, a PDF. So I have here um, the result of it. So that's this one. So here you can see I'm drawing the, the entire um, wall that I just showed. And here I have another page with some text and some graphics. So this graphics is also an addition, um, an addition to this plugin, which, which makes it very convenient if you need to do some, some graphics for uh, analyzing some data. This component already has uh, this, um, this, sorry, this plugin has already does uh, these components for you ready to be used. So if we go to PDF Plus, PDF, we have the add shard, add pie shard, and graph data components. And this one basically allows you to create these graphics as bars, or bar, bar stacked columns, column stack line area. Um, so you can really have complete control over how these, uh, these bars look like, which data you want to show. So here, for example, um, I have these labels, of course, just for testing, these, um, these numbers and these colors. So all of that is customizable. So you can really create all of your graphs. So that's a plus for this plugin and it's now supported by us. And of course, through our download export, com download export component, you can get these PDFs through uh, the online applications in ShipDiver. The next plugin is Bitmap Plus. Bitmap Plus um, basically edits uh, images. It's not like the Squid plugin because the Squid plugin is mainly to create images from scratch, whereas this one is mainly focused. It, it, you can also create images from scratch, but it's mainly focused on editing existing images as well. So here, for example, I have um, this image, this puppy, and then I can, for example, crop the image. So that's one of the components here. So I can crop the image based on a, 
on a rectangle that I am providing. I can rotate the image. Um, I can add some filters to the image. This is one filter, this is another filter. And here I have another filter, which I am also looping through. So I, I'm using also the Anemone um, plugin to look through it. So as you can see, if I just, if I just apply this effect once, then my dog looks like this. But if I loop through it to, with the Anemone component, I can loop through it. In this case, I'm saying three times, then our result will be a bit more abstract, let's say. And then of course, I can then add that, for example, into the PDF that I just showed you, because that's also part, that's also one of the components that the PDF plus component, that the PDF plus plugin has. Um, finally, you can also um, extract data from these images. So in this case, for example, I'm tracing the image, so I can extract all the all of the curves from it. The next plugin is um, Giver. Um, this plugin, I'm just going to mention it. I don't have an example for it, but it's mainly for parametric timber engineering tools. So if you are into this industry, we already support this plugin. So have a look at it and you can start using it. The next plugin is MetaHopper. This plugin is mainly um, to control your canvas. So if we go to MetaHopper here, this allows you to control your canvas by, um, for example, accessing, accessing information of the document or retrieving components. In this case, the examples that I have is, for example, I have this slider and I want to extract from this slider the bounds of it. So I cannot extract just from this slider that it goes from 34 to 234, this is slider, but with the MetaHopper component, this one allows me to extract this data. So now I can do something with it. So for example, here I'm saying that if the value, my current value is equal to the minimum value, then I do something. So in this case, well, I'm just activating this, uh, this panel that says it is the mean value, uh, but of course you could do something else. Similar happens here with the, um, um, with the value list component where I cannot extract this data um, that, that you provide here in any other way, but with the MetaHopper uh, plugin. So with the MetaHopper Meta plugin, I can connect this list data component and I can get all the keys and all the values from it. And one of the main reasons why we also support this one is because of this component, the grab and ungrab um, components, which allow us to group data, like you would use the group component, which allows, uh, allows you to uh, group geometry. So this component just allows you to group geometry, but this one allows us to also group data. So in this case, for example, I'm using it to sort um, these branches. So these branches just have some test data. And I can just use, for example, the first number of it um, to sort my branches. So I have all of the first number, 67, 245. I'm going to store them. But of course, because we have everything contained in, in this wrapper, then I can flatten here without losing the um, grouping of my branches, then sort this, this grab, uh, grab it data and then ungrab it again. So we have now uh, our branches as we had it at the beginning, the three branches, but they are sorted based on this value. So it really allows you to do a lot of operations when it comes to just working with data and make them easier to work with. For this plugin though, we don't support all of the components and that happens with many plugins. Uh, and the reason is because they, um, they access the, the document, the Rhino document, which is something that we don't allow. Everything has to happen inside Grasshopper. So if we come here and look for Meta Hopper, so you can see here, we have it supported. It, it is supported, but here I have a list of disallowed components, so components that you cannot use because they access the document. So for, a, for a, every single plugin that we support, there are some of them where everything is supported, but others we really have to just support a specific components. So if you, if you have any other plugin that you want to use, please check here that it, not just that the plugin is supported, but also the component is not, um, it's not forbidden, it's not disallowed. And we go finally to our uh, last, um, our last plugin, which is SwiftLet. SwiftLet is a very powerful plugin which allows you to connect with external APIs, um, APIs. So this plugin, with this plugin, you can extract data basically from the internet um, through these API, through these APIs. So a, a quick example that I have here is, for example, I want to get the metal price per gram of I don't know gold or uh, silver or platinum or any other, and I want to extract the price that is right now. 
So the only way to do that is, well, if you were, if you were to connect directly to the internet and extract this data. So in this case, I found an API through this website, rapidapi.com. Uh, this website has many plugins of all sorts of kinds. So for example, if I want the weather somewhere, if I want a translation of uh, some text, so it's it's a it's a it's a website which which uh, brings all a lot of APIs together, so you can easily search through them. Um, and in this case, I am using these uh, live metal um, prices uh, API, and uh, it's very easy to map for me how to use this with Grasshopper because here you can see it says that I need to um, call a get uh, from from the um, from the API. So if I come here. To the plugin, you can see that there is a component called get. So it's very easy to know, OK, I need a get component. So I put it there. Then it tells me, um, well, I need some header parameters. So if I come back here, I have a component called header. So that's what I put here. So I can easily map and recognize how, start, how I start to connect my API so that at the end, I can extract the information that I want. So in this case, I think this is the price of gold <clears throat> uh, at 14K. But I have here, for example, the, the price of um, silver, I think is that one. And I think this one is platinum, I think. I'm not, maybe this one is silver and this one is platinum, actually. So yeah, I can extract all of these uh, prices. I have also another example that I, have, that I found uh, about air quality. So I can, uh, first of all, I use one API, which allows me to get coordinates by location. So I'm putting here, for example, Bogota. And when I put that, that uh, city, this, this um, um, this uh, API gives, gives me back the coordinates of it. Now with these coordinates, I can connect with a second API, which gives me the air quality. So because this API requires the coordinates. So after I extract all of this data, finally I get the current air quality in Bogota and I get all of this data, which I can use now, for example, in the PDF plus component, the PDF plus plugin to create uh, all of these graphs. So it's very powerful. So the last thing just to connect with Matthew is that you can also connect with Swiftlet with, for example, the Google Spreadsheet API through the Swiftlet uh, plugin. So Matthew will take over here and show you how that works. Thank you, Edwin. Um, you, run, you run through a lot of features again <clears throat> in a short time. Uh, I won't lose too much time. Um, yeah, thank you for the... Um, for the transition. So I just wanted to mention uh, this and connect to some other things I'm going to talk about. Um, with uh, in, in my side of the webinar because in in the last i mean forever we've had uh, requests in this direction but a lot in the last uh, uh year uh, about how to um uh, well to connect to databases to how, how to to drive a shape diver application with um with your own data so uh, stored you know in any um, location any any convenient location and uh, one of the answers we've had since Swiftlet uh, uh, is uh, supported is that uh, Swiftlet allows you to, for example, connect with a Google Sheet if you if you have um, data stored on a Google Sheet. So here I, I created these uh, small examples, which we'll share, like all the examples um, Edwin has talked about, uh, with a simple sheet. And here uh, the idea is that you can connect using Swiftlet. You can give your sheet ID here, and uh, and you need to create a, an API key uh, from your Google account. So I store them here in text parameters, and here I can directly access uh, from a get from a get request to my um, to my uh, Google Sheet the data that's uh, stored there. You get it as a JSON uh, object, but Swiftlet as well as Shapediver and other plugins are very uh, convenient to convenient tools to manipulate JSON objects. So that's um, that's really easy to, to to process them. And of course, uh, you I can make a get request, but also post requests, and I can um, then also at the end fill a Google Sheet from you know the my algorithm in Grasshopper. And essentially, I wanted to use this last, last Swiftlet example to um, talk about some other new features uh, that come well partly uh, from um, uh, updates to the ShapeDiver plugin, so on our side, and partly from Rhino 8, and uh, and which allow other things. So in this case, uh, as my first example, allow to uh, have uh, Excel in, uh, input and output from ShapeDiver models. Uh, and here, the, the the key component on the ShapeDiver side is the addition uh, of uh, stream import and out uh, and export uh, components. So those are new import and export components that uh, add, are added to uh, our existing ones. So geometry, bitmap, and text were already supported. And for exporting a, a variety of uh, of CAD files, 
already. And the idea to support, to add stream import and export component is to re vi really virtually uh, uh, support any file format uh, existing and to import this in Rhino, in, uh, in Grasshopper as a memory, what we call a memory stream object, which is essentially a, a, a data stream, which is um, uh, completely agnostic to its contents uh, and can easily be then imported into Grasshopper through our plugin and exported from Grasshopper on the other side. Now, the idea is that uh, I can, for example, with this stream, import uh, uh, an Excel file and uh, connect with the second uh, new feature, the Rhino 8 feature, which makes this very interesting, which is the fact that in Rhino 8, both scripting components, so both in Python and C Sharp, uh, we can use external uh, packages um, uh, and enrich what is possi already possible with the script components uh, with really uh, an uh, infinity of new uh, features. So in, in the case of this example that I'm showing, I imported my Excel file as a stream. And now I, I um, wrote a quick uh, C-sharp script uh, where I included the, this NuGet pa package, which is the NPOI library. And the API library is a simple library which allows to read and write um, Excel files and actually Word files too, I didn't test yet. Uh, and here I just have my simple script where I import my uh, stream objects. I, I cast it as a workbook and an Excel workbook, which works because I know my file contains the workbook. And then I can start exploring and reading the contents of this file and outputting them from my uh, script components. So here we can see I already have my uh, data organized in a, in a tree. And in this example, I didn't do anything super interesting with it, but I, uh, I am displaying it as a, as a 3D uh, Excel file, essentially. So that's one more example of, uh, well, manipulating uh, data and, and, and driving your shared data models through data. Uh, but since I'm uh, talking about these new stream import and export components and uh, the, the new scripting in Rhino 8, I uh, thought I would uh, go through a second example of what's possible using these new components. And here I uh, thought, well, another um, uh, feature that was requested by a lot of um, shader users along the years is uh, to import and export multiple files at the same time, because we've uh, always supported one file, but not multiple. And while we will still work on um, maybe a native support for, for some file formats uh, uh, of this in Shadowdiver, uh, the idea is that through the stream components and the scripting in Rhino 8, this is already possible, essentially. And here, what I did is that I uh, stored uh, uh, several uh, images here. In my case, uh, in my first example here, those are um, the icons of some components of the plugin and, pack, uh, and uh, put them in a zip file. And then I used, uh, uh, well, the stream import component to uh, import uh, those files in Grasshopper. And then through scripts uh, and the compression um, uh, libraries, uh, the system compression libraries, I could do essentially the same here, uh, you know, import my stream, cast it as a zip archive, and then read through the contents, uh, which in my case are PNG files, and output uh, the PNG files as images in, um, in Grasshopper. And here in this example, I, I have the, the mirror script, which takes several files. So in, in the case of my uh, definition, I, I applied some filter to the files. So for example, here I could make them all, um, uh, no, that's not, that's not to the 3D objects, but that's to the exported files. And then I can, I can also take a bunch of image files or any other format and put them in a strip, uh, in, a, in a zip archive, which I cast to a, st a memory stream object and export it using the, um, uh, the stream export options. So I would like to, at least for this example, go to uh, my example on Shadiver, already uh, uploaded to Shadiver. Uh, so here I uploaded the, the file. So by the way, this uh, display is just uh, uh, me, again, doing something useless just to show how, how it works and displaying the, the images from the archive in, uh, in a queue. Uh, but this is my, uh, uh, my um, uploaded uh, model. And here I can, for example, uh, look at another zip archive that I have with, uh, with uh, some pictures that uh, a friend took at the zoo in Vienna a while ago. And here it's the same. It's looking at um, uh, the files I stored in this um, in this zip archive. I can apply, uh, and again, I think, yeah, I, I didn't um, apply the filters to the to the three D geometry. So it's just gonna um, be done in the ah, yeah, no, I have to apply the filter. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, and now I can filter the images. Uh, so for example, I can make them uh, black and white. If I if I use the red channel for all channels. 
well, anyways, uh, you get the gist of it. And now I can export it and uh, I get uh, effectively, uh, as I uh, explained from Grasshopper, uh, a zip archive with my uh, images, uh, with the filter applied that I, I used, by the way, I used bitmap plus as well uh, to, to filter them. And here is my um, my set of um, output files, right? So it's like a, an elegant solution uh, and, and also um, uh, an inspiration for everything that can be done with the combination of these two new features on ChefDiver and in Rhino Kids. Um, I think in terms of what happens inside, uh, well, uh, not, not completely. So I, I have one last uh, thing that I wanted to show inside Grasshopper before before I move on to pure, uh, let's say pure ChefDiver platform features. Uh, and which is that uh, one of the new things uh, we added to the, to the plugin, that's not just on Rhino 8, by the way, that's, uh, that's a general feature, is that um, from when I work inside Grasshopper and I work on a, uh, for example, when I work on a definition that I already uploaded to, uh, to ChefDiver, I am now able to load uh, parameter values uh, that I've exported from the platform. And these are existing features, which I can uh, um, uh, have another look at, a quick look at now, in case you, you're not aware of them. But when I work on, um, on my model on ChefDiver, I'm always able to export to, on the one hand, export the set of parameter values to uh, JSON files from my model here. So for example, I'm, I'm exporting it here as JSON instead of parameters. And I'm always uh, able also to create safe states from uh, where I am. So I'm gonna create another one here um, with, uh, with blanks. And here I can create a safe state. So 20 blanks public. And uh, and both of those uh, features are can be used in very different contexts, uh, but both are ways to save the state of uh, my current uh, shader model here. And here, with these new uh, features that we added to the plugin, what I can do is open my definition in, um, in Grasshopper, and it's a really old definition, so I just realized materials are not displayed. I should probably update the old components, but that won't change. Uh, that won't affect my point. So in ChefDiver here, I can go and load parameter values from JSON, for example, and I can load these JSON uh, objects that I just exported. And here I get a report, yes, I, well, the algorithm found uh, matching parameters and they, they were updated. And you can see that my uh, all my parameters were updated to the values that are stored in this uh, JSON. Yeah, right. The second way uh, uh, to load uh, these values is to use uh, a safe state. And here, this is uh, something that can be done by logging in here inside Grasshopper. So this is something that uh, we've had for a while uh, that can be used for multiple um, uh, features of ShapeDiver, uh, in particular the desktop clients feature, uh, which and it allows you to um, authenticate to your ShapeDiver account directly from inside uh, Grasshopper. So here I'm logged in now. And that means that I can uh, access information from my uh, ShapeDiver account. Uh, and in particular, I can load uh, a safe state here. So if I if I go here and I have here, I can uh, copy the link uh, to the safe state and uh, load it directly from uh, Grasshopper here. And same thing, uh, I get a report and I load uh, the uh, the parameters stored inside the safe state. All right, so that's uh, one of the new things that essentially is uh, between the plugin and the platform, so combining the, the, these two sides of the product, uh, and which can be used uh, either uh, by, for example, if you're processing client, um, uh, client orders with your shared models, or, for example, if you've noticed that for some computations, something wrong happened, so to help you profile and debug your models, you can directly load uh, uh, the values here from all computations, then export them and load in Grasshopper to see if something uh, wrong happened in Grasshopper. Um, and now that I'm on the platform, I can uh, go further uh, with um, platform-specific uh, features. One of them here, uh, I mean, one a, a group of new features that we've added is that you can you you might notice here that in this page. Um, you have a lot of, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of information that is shown. You have your safe states, you have attribute visualization, and you have this desktop client uh, section. And for some models, uh, uh, you might want to use the model view page of ShapeDiver as a presentation tool that you can share with, with uh, external people uh, to show them uh, exactly what you want them to see. And 
so that's why we've added some uh, some layout features, let's say I call them layout features, that allow to curate a bit what you want to show on your um, model view page. So here I could, for example, hide safe state visualization, all, all, all of these things, and just keep um, the information uh, shown on the, sh on the page to the minimum. One thing that can also be done is to uh, now, and that's been requested a lot also by our users, is instead of separating parameters and outputs, to group them together in the same, uh, same uh, table and also um, reorganize them together, uh, which uh, in some cases um, might uh, provide a better user experience for the end users of your shared learning models. Right, so here I, sh I hit everything basically, so I just have parameters and the export is grouped with the parameter. Uh, so that's something that works in the model view page, but also in the iframe. So this, uh, uh, this can be controlled um, directly through iframe settings here in my uh, edit page. And I have almost the same, um, uh, the same options, uh, not, not exactly. Uh, but what's in interesting to see here is that um, you can hide or show safe states in iframe, which means that um, I can transition to something else that's new in the, in, the, in, in the platform, which is that iframes can now be displayed uh, as part of the um, uh, iframes that you can embed on your website. So here in this case, I have, um, I'm not sure, did I do this properly? Because I hit, ah, okay. There might be an issue here in this case because I grouped parameters and exports, um, but I did see this on a lot of uh, models. And uh, you can uh, show safe states and display a list of safe states inside the iframe uh, to let users uh, navigate them. Um, yeah, so that's another uh, new thing. And now I will go to, um, ah, there, there's one more that I, that I can show here, uh, one more thing, which is that we made it a bit, uh, well, in, in the same uh, spirit of, uh, curating a bit more what uh, what the consumers, what the people you share your model with or show or embed, uh, what, what they see and what they can do with your models. We also added um, a, a more fine-grained control of what happens when you share models with other shared data users. So let's say here I have this model and I want to share it with, uh, well, with Edwin. For example, of course, Edwin has, has tons of different accounts, so I have to pick one. And now I can, uh, well, it was already possible to for me to control if Edwin can, for example, trigger exports for my model or not, if he can just view it, if Edwin can use it in desktop clients. And now we added two new options, which is uh, the ability to download the model. So download the Grasshopper file, which uh, I always have for my own models, but now I can also share it with other people. And uh, actually what was already there is analytics. And now what you can also share is the ability to use in desktop clients. So to directly control uh, shared level models uh, from inside Rhino or Illustrator or uh, any other clients we, we add in the future. Um, yeah, so that's that's it for like the, these new sets of, uh, let's say more, a bit more technical features uh, that are part of your models that are available as uh, uh, model authors. And now uh, what I can also show is, um, well, something that you might have, uh, have seen um, happen in, in the last few months, which is that we added um, a, a huge set of uh, post-processing features to uh, allow some more fine-grained control of the rendering of your models on the platform. So that's something that might have surprised uh, some of you in the last few months because we decided to uh, enable this a new ambient occlusion algorithm for most models by default because we thought it made you know, 99% uh, of the older models look better. Uh, so here you can see that by default, I have my ambient occlusion allowed. But if you go in the settings, you also notice that you can control it and, and control some uh, some some more settings to um, well to have a better um, uh, control over exactly how the algorithm works and make it look perfect for your own model. All right. So there's actually two uh, ambient occlusion uh, uh, algorithms which work a bit differently in different contexts, and also a set of other. Um, uh, effects, which maybe, for example, some of them don't uh, make sense for this current model. But for example, if I look at um, this other model um, in the automotive industry, this uh, Lamborghini, Lamborghini Huracan, uh, then I can, uh, well, still use ambient occlusion, uh, which is already uh, making my model look much more realistic. Um, but I can also, for example, use the bloom effects which um, can also be controlled uh, fine-grained and 
in this case, for example, every uh, this transparent surface is here uh, look uh, much 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 shinier. This is something that uh, we applied recently <clears throat> in several examples in the jewelry industry as well. I think I'll have to start closing some tabs because uh, I'm getting slow. Yeah, so here, for example, is an example in jewelry that uh, makes use of these two effects and maybe some other ones uh, to provide a really nice um, uh, realistic model. Um, yeah, and I had a last one here, which is a model that you might see uh, more often these days because it's linked to other new features that we have uh, uh, upcoming. Uh, but here I have uh, a model, uh, well, just this one model that uh, makes it clear how um, ambient occlusion uh, in particular uh, is a great way to enhance uh, models for the AEC industry. <clears throat> All right, I think that's it for uh, this uh, set of new features. And I will go back to the presentation uh, to get started, uh, to get finished. And I think Edwin stopped here, so I'll start again the slideshow. And before we uh, move on to the Q&A session, which by the way, so we wanted to pack everything into one hour and I think uh, we managed to, to make this happen. Uh, but then we'll uh, go on an um, open Q&A session. Uh, so if you have more time, uh, we'll answer as many questions as you want. Maybe not the whole night, but for a while. Um, but before that, uh, fi some final comments. And actually that's, uh, there's a nice screenshot, but I can also show you directly on the platform. That's something new that's not really a feature, but let's say, uh, uh, part of our initiative to uh, get closer uh, to our, to the users and get more feedback and, and iterate uh, nicely with the, with the community is, um, well, these two uh, levels of, um, of catch-ups and calls that we uh, added uh, to our schedule. Once a week, uh, community catch-ups, which all, all our users can join and are welcome to join uh, uh, and where you know we look at features in progress uh, the, the latest things we work on but also troubleshoot any any grasshopper issues or any basic problems that, that um, any, any of you uh, might have and discuss um, discuss uh, uh, better ways to, to handle these things and the second thing is our onboarding sessions uh, held by, uh, by Alex my colleague uh, the CTO uh, which are um, uh, made for our uh, paying uh, customers in this case, and uh, allow them to go more in depth as there. And you know, we we want to target in this case the users that already are trying to build an application based on uh, Shape Diver, and they are maybe using our APIs and tools to uh, start developing this application or more advanced features in general, and uh, then would get uh, curated help from Alex and also uh, some other of my other of my colleagues. Um, yeah, that's uh, one of the last things I wanted to mention. Uh, mention and um, in uh, on top of that, so um, yeah, the summary of this webinar will uh, is already available, I think, on the blog or will be in the next uh, few hours, and we'll have the recording along with uh, with crossover files um, on YouTube by uh, next week. But you can also obviously reach us in the contact form on our website or ask questions in the forum as you uh, as usual. Uh, that's it. So thank you uh, to everyone who uh, joined and joined until the end, uh, in particular. And I think we can. I'll bring back Edwin now. And uh, if anyone has questions, uh, we are happy to answer them. I'll stop sharing for now, but I can either. There is, I, there is yeah. one question regarding safe states. Mm -hmm. Is there a limit for safe states of a model? I know that we've had a question about this recently. I don't remember emails or or, um, or on the forum about the fact uh, about some problems when there were a lot of safe states uh, associated with one model. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I mean, in in theory, no. So that's something that I have to test. And um, and if you have experienced a limit with the number of safe states you can have, then uh, that's that's a bug that we that we can look at. Um, but yeah, that's I I, I confess I, I haven't uh, tried to save more than twenty states for a model. I think so. That's um, something to look at. Yeah. So there are some people already asking for the new feature that we didn't present. <laughs> <laughs> so when when is the drawing points cures in the viewer available? Yeah, so um, the thing with new features is is that um, it can mean a, a lot of things. And, and usually what we try to do is to uh, be lean and release the first version of the feature and, and several versions, improving it over time. So 
In terms of the drawing tool, uh, we have um, a really advanced version of it that's, uh, that will be available in the, in the, in the viewer API uh, very soon uh, and make it easy to create this sort of uh, uh, point and line interactions, which you might have seen on, in, on LinkedIn or on, in some of our communication recently. Uh, but of course, the ultimate goal for the drawing tool is to make them a no-code tool that you don't need to use any APIs to use. And the idea is that we'll, we're going to connect them to new components in the shared development plugin, so you can add a new, comp a new type of input that um, is translated as a, as a, as a polyline uh, input, for example. And this is uh, something that will come, uh, let's say, in a, a bit after uh, this first uh, API release, but we're still aiming to have uh, um, a first version of this uh, in the first half of this year. So that's kind of like a risky promise that I'm making, uh, but um, that's, that's- Well, I think there's a feature that will definitely show during the fall update. And that's uh, the full, uh, that's anyways, we have the, the um, now the idea is to have another full update and to have a bi biannual uh, updates about the new features. Again, uh, in relation to what I just said to, you know, be closer to the community and provide uh, more updates, get more feedback. So definitely that's that's coming soon, yeah. Okay. Next question is, are there limitations on the Rhino Python libraries which can be used? Are NumPy pandas supported? So uh, I'm glad this question was asked because that's some of the things I tried, to, I went through very fast because of uh, uh, time limits. So it's the same, uh, in this case, it's the same um, uh, uh, um, uh, method for both C Sharp with uh, NuGet packages and Python with, uh, with uh, libraries. Uh, essentially, if you're uh, familiar with, with the way it works in Shapediver to upload models that include scripts, which is, by the way, uh, not available if you're a free user, so that's just for uh, premium users. Uh, and the way it works is that if you try to upload a model with a script, we have a manual checking pro process um, where uh, members of our team uh, check that the scripts, well, first of all, make sense uh, in Shapediver and will not damage um, our servers or don't contain malicious code. So that's something that's needed. And in this case, um, we, uh, well, I say we, but it's Alex mostly, <laughs> uh, made it work with McNeil that we, on our servers, we can on the fly install new packages that were not uh, used uh, before, but we, we still have this uh, manual checking step. So essentially when a new package is included in a script um, that you try to upload, we'll have to review and make sure that this package works and, and can be used in the context of Shape Diver. Um, so what we'll do is that we'll, um, I, I wanted to do that before the, the webinar, I'll have it this week, a new page on the documentation with a list of packages that we already tested and that we know uh, are already available and work on our servers. Um, for example, the ones I showed for C-sharp. Uh, but for the next ones, I think um, it's gonna be a, pro a, you know, a progressive um, uh, process where we have to check and essentially uh, probably through discussions on the forum, if you if you need a new package to be installed or you think it would make sense, then that's gonna be the best way. We you, you propose it on the forum and we start a discussion. We ask for the use cases for this for these packages and um, we move forward like this. Yeah. Okay. Next one is um, is it possible to hide the import and export button in on the iframe? Yes, so I think that's uh, related to um, the feature I showed about grouping um, parameters and exports, uh, probably. Um, and that's that works. I, I showed it quickly in the platform, but that was the same in the iframe. I, and actually, when we uh, uh, added this uh, functionality, we had mostly the iframe in, in mind because we know that when the model is embedded, mostly one, one panel where everything is uh, together makes more sense, uh, especially because a lot of the times, um, this is use cases where uh, there's an iframe that contains you know a lot of things and then uh, uses the email export component and where uh, for the exports uh, uh, a lot of the times the models ask users for their email or for for their information and this can now be grouped nicely in a, in the same group as um, as an export button and uh, yeah that provides a more intuitive uh, experience. I mean, in general, I think here, if if, it's, if the question is referring to specific imports and exports, then every single parameter, including imports and including exports, I think, have the, yeah, including export as well, have these little, um, um, maybe I can share my screen. Quickly. Yeah. 
you see my screen? Yes, it's here. Yeah, so every single parameter here has this um, icon where you, in the edit mode, right now in the edit mode of the model, and I can click on this, save, and, the, and then the, the live, live model will not show these parameters. So that also includes here the import. So this is an import image, and then I can just hide it and then save it, and then it won't be available anymore in the live version. Um, okay, the next question is, is there, any progress with ShapeDiver Marketplace, meaning designers can upload GH models and end customers can pay for the exports? Yeah, that's um, that's a big question, uh, this one. Uh, and it's, I can honestly say that this is something that is really interesting to us and still where we see a big potential and we would love to to, to get to this uh, next stage uh, for, for ShapeDiver. Uh, but that's obviously something that's more a structural change in also how the platform uh, works and everything. So there's no uh, concrete timeline uh, for you know the marketplace version of, of the platform. What I can already say, and without giving too much details, is that um, we're working on uh, restructuring of, of of pricing and how users are using ShapeDiver and and how how can you know our credit system be used um, to uh, uh, to control you know. Who and what? Who, who's consuming models? Who, who's responsible for the the you know the exports, the the, the interactions with, with with specific models that you share, that you show to your organization, and etc. And this uh, this restructuring is a first step. Could be a first step to this um, next stage of uh, Shedever as a marketplace. Yeah. Okay. The next one is uh, it will be possible to export an Excel file in XLS format. Yeah, so I, I went a bit uh, more quick on this example. So if you remember by my archive, zip archive example, I have both sides, uh, import and export. Uh, in my example about Excel, I just have the you know, imported file just because I didn't have to, time to now look and, and write another script that you know, takes data and writes it uh, nicely to an Excel file. But that's, uh, that's, that's working the same. So it's gonna be exactly the same process. And actually I'll finalize the example and when I, when I post it, Along with you know the recording of the webinar and etc., there should be already the both sides, the import and the export, uh, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this one. Hi. Are you going to create more tutorials about creating online configurators? <laughs> so I guess that's for YouTube, YouTube tutorials, or what does that mean? <laughs> so yeah, that's that can be, mean a lot of things, right? So is it, um, Edwin obviously has, has done a lot of nice tutorials over the years uh, about how to work in Grasshopper and how to organize your data and how to you know, do everything you need. Um, so if that means more Grasshopper tutorials, that's one thing. Probably we'll keep having tutorials about a lot of features. And I mean, we didn't have a tutorial that handled you know, a whole example, like you did the table configurator with like a lot mm -hmm. of videos. Maybe at some point we could do like a refreshed version of that or with including new features. But I think that this question is probably about, um, well, how, Okay, I have my shape diver model. I could upload my Grasshopper file. I have my shape diver model. It works well. How do I create a configurator from that? Meaning, how do I take my shape diver model and you know put it in my website and, and create everything around it? And uh, well, more tutorials. Sure, that's something that uh, is always interesting. But what we've noticed is that in any case, I mean, we have extensive documentation for APIs and how to do this in in general. What we've noticed is that a lot of users uh, that use Grasshopper and even like professional users of, of Grasshopper uh, uh, sometimes are stuck with the step of you know getting more in-depth involved with uh, web development tools. And here, what we'll soon propose uh, more than more tutorials is actually probably better ways to to do this without having to code um, too much. So essentially. Just like you know, we have we we mentioned the point line drawing tools now, which allow to um, do some more advanced things without having uh, to do some more development. We will soon um, add some features to be able to add more logic in the interface to curate a bit more where um, different panels are and and create a, a, a presentation experience as a whole that can be then embedded into a website or or such. So yeah, yeah. depending on whether this, the the question was going, but I think that's that's what we're we are. So I mean, if I can add here real quick, is that we're gonna make 
we're going to make it easier for someone with only Grasshopper knowledge to create better looking online configurators that are easier to integrate into a website. As we've seen that, you know, uh, even though our APIs are quite useful and powerful, uh, you require web development knowledge besides the Grasshopper knowledge needed to create a shape ladder model. So our goal is to make it easier for Grasshopper experts to complete a project, including the online configurator, which means the online tool and the final website. But it, this is coming, so we don't want to spoil, uh, you know, spoil the, some surprises we're having coming up. But this is coming. Uh, we are fairly advanced uh, in in this, and, and and I think we're gonna we're gonna surprise a lot of people in the next months. Okay, so next one. Are you throwing any ideas around on how to parallelize computations in the viewer? Maybe load multiple GH models in the same viewer? So this is already possible, but a lot of people don't know. So maybe you can clarify, Matthew. Yeah, uh, it's it's a bit similar. I mean, you know, I, I like to uh, be holistic about uh, what we talk about now. And it's, it's in the same direction of, of this question of asking for tutorials. Uh, because it's possible now to, it, that, that's been possible for years even, I think two, two years, at least two, three years, to load several uh, Grasshopper models in the same view, uh, shader models in the same viewer. And actually we have, Edwin has, uh, maybe you can, I don't know what we can show, but I think we can, one of the configurators you worked on that uses at least three, three Grasshopper files, uh, maybe more, uh, in order to, well, parallelize is one thing, so really uh, optimize the performance of the online configurator. Uh, but also, you know, organize your data better. And, and so the thing is that it's like for the creating a configurator tutorials. This is something that's in our documentation, uh, and we could have more tutorials um, uh, to do that specifically for developers. But in in this case, I I feel like there's also and it it fits with like a general, you know, strategy we we have to, as Ezekiel said said, make it easier for Grasshopper developer uh, users to do more. Uh, it makes think, uh, sense for us to think about new features on the platform to directly you know, merge uh, several shader models into, into one and, um, and have a more complex uh, application uh, from that. Uh, but yeah, I think Edwin, if you, um, I, I don't know what you said, if you wanted to show an example of the multiple shared driver model configurator. If you need more time, I can answer a quick question uh, as you're loading it. Um, I think, yeah, there was a question actually, I think uh, it's a follow-up to what I answered uh, about hiding the import export buttons inside the iframe because the user met the three dots button. So the menu, um, uh, the menu to import and export the JSON uh, 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 parameters. And I think now that's not, you know, well, I know now that's not possible. Actually, the thing is that the three dots were not in the iframe for a very long time and we added them recently, but it's true that now they have to be there and that you cannot hide them, but that's a really simple thing. I'm gonna, that's a good point. So I'm gonna add that to the backlog and we can add this feature uh, in, uh, in one of the next videos. Okay. So we have two more like the Sebastian can do and uh, medium. Yeah. So, um, da -da -da. Should I read it? Yeah, I mean, the, you mean the two long ones by by Sebastian? Yeah. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can read them in whole. Yeah, and then think about. It. So, okay. So we have. It would be incredibly useful if ShapeDiver were to establish a centralized library containing a collection of commonly used scripts and components. This library would serve as a valuable resource for users allowing them to access pre-built solutions for various functionalities without the need to reinvent the wheel for, with each project. By providing such a resource, Shebaver could significantly streamline the development process for its users, enabling them to leverage existing solutions and focus their efforts on unique aspects of the project. It would foster collaboration and knowledge sharing within the Shebaver community as users could contribute their own scripts and components to the library for the benefits of others. So that's again a big topic. I'll try to uh, stick um, to uh, a two three minutes answer so we can then address uh, what, what's left this is linked to the previous uh, uh question by rafael about the marketplace uh which is if, if i talk a bit more about the marketplace id that's the idea that you could online uh put your models online and give access to these models to other people uh, and then you know share them and even monetize your own work uh, th uh through the usage of other shared users and 
I feel like the, the, the idea, the strategy be behind this marketplace is similar to what Sebastian is talking about here, which is that um, uh, this would uh, th this would make a lot of sense in the context of uh, you know creating tools that can be reused in a lot of contexts, creating reusable uh, 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 workflows, reusable algorithms, which make sense uh, as you know components almost uh, uses them as components in bigger processes, bigger applications, or even directly from inside Shape Diver, uh, from inside Cross Software. I mean. So uh, today we didn't talk about the Shape Diver client plugin, for example, but it's already possible to use Shape Diver models as components inside Grasshopper and integrate them in bigger definitions and even connect and connect Shape Diver models together uh, to create bigger um, uh, bigger uh, algorithms. So this is something that is linked to the marketplace uh, uh, question, and that would be like a longer term solution. But the idea uh, uh, is that we already have four teams um, the possibility to create organizations and share models on the organization level, so make them uh, make your models visible for the entire organization. And if you work like this, um, along with the desktop clients, so basically make, make your work available to your entire team through the desktop clients, then uh, the models shared at the organization level, in a sense, already uh, provide a library that you can use for uh, and, and share and you can you know you can up upload new models new versions of the models you already uploaded and um, and have this shareable knowledge library within a team right so that's here the the question is always okay what we we have we always have to reverse engineering from use cases from specific use cases uh, to see okay which of our uh, existing features are answers to that and in which direction should we go? when the features are missing to, to solve these use cases. Okay, that's what I would say about this topic uh, right now. Uh, yeah, and yeah. last one from Miriam. Uh, if we're sending a model for client interaction, do we have specific control of who's interacting with it? Yes, so, um, uh, so that's, again, it depends uh, on which, um, uh, in, in which context and in which the, the, the specific use case in, in this case. So if you have a team, um, uh, well, let's say, okay, if, you, if your client has a, a shared driver account, you can share uh, the model just with them, right? Or if you have, if you're in a team, if you have an organization on shared driver, you can share your model with just a specific uh, um, uh, people. Um, now, if you have, uh, what, what we've noticed is that we the, the way organizations work on Shapedriver now is there's one level with specific uh, permissions for different users. So there's users who can just upload models and share them with the team. There's users who can see all models like administrators and managers. But we've already had several requests and the need for a more fine-grained fine levels in the organization to create separate teams of people and then be able to have permissions that are restricting uh, to, to these teams. So essentially, um, Yes, there's already a bunch of different features that allows you to control who is who has access to your uh, shared lab models. Um, but if depending on the use of the specific use case and in which context uh, we're looking at, um, then it's possible that some more fine-grained features that we have in mind will uh, solve uh, the rest. So if, so if specific is not possible yet, uh, we're always happy to discuss. Uh, you know, I think. I can add something here, Matthew. You can limit, you can share a specific model with a specific shape diver user. Mm -hmm. you know? So if you're sharing a model and you want only one person to be able to see it and interact with it, then that other person is a shape diver account. You know? And then you can specifically share a model with a specific person, and that's how you limit that person interacting with it. But if maybe she's uh, mentioning that maybe during a live session, she wants to share a model and maybe allow someone to interact with it or not during the live session. That's not possible with Shape Diver, right? Because each one initiates its own session. So whoever is in the, has their session loaded in the browser, that's who controls it. So it's two different topics, but maybe she meant one or the other. Yeah, but I think uh, Miriam, uh, hi Miriam, by the way. Um, uh, I, I understand better with the follow-up question, which, which is, can there be guests in the account? So I understand the use case where you have your team, but you also want to share from collaborators and people outside of the team, maybe temporary share uh, um, uh, models. And that's something that's, you know, this more fine-grained control, uh, that's something we're, we're thinking about, about how to, uh, to, to do this. I mean, you can always invite someone to your team and then revoke in, uh, invitation. So that's, that's always something that's possible. Uh, but in this case, maybe something that's also possible is to use the link sharing feature, which is uh, the feature where you have 
that's you know this like only people with a link so essentially you can share the link with someone and only people with the link can can uh, can visualize the the model so then you could do it like this and you can always revoke this link as well uh, after a period of time yeah, so here, you can have multiple seats in your account and then dedicate one seat for a guest yeah so the idea is that the way teams work now is not exactly made for that i think we can that's one of the things we can improve in the future it's not exactly made for guests because you have to invite them and then you know just suspend their accounts but they're still listed as, as members so i think the idea of having this more temporary members feature is something that's interesting and we can um, we can look at in the near future yeah. i think that's it those are the questions okay can you hear me yeah yeah we had some issues before. just to finish one thing with the offset that they ask if the new offset um, algorithm if it uh, if it um, keeps the uh, control points it doesn't i just tested and it doesn't so it's okay in terms of control points it works like the rhino 7 version which makes sense because of the way it works it pr prioritizes the distance between the curve like curvatures instead of the control points um but anyways i think there was a question about like how does that how do you make that work then with the loft uh, component and in the loft component, you have these loft options where you can just click on align sections, and that should be it. Um, or you can uh, use the loose uh, offset component, or you can rebuild your curve and then loft. So there are plenty of options to go mm -hmm. on this problem. Yeah. That's it. All right. Then I think uh, we went over all the questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I'll thank you again to everyone who's still there. and. Um, to, for listening to us for so long, and yeah, we can. Uh, we are happy to see you again, um, probably in the fall. We don't have a date yet, but uh, in the fall, and in the fall, we, uh, as Ezekiel mentioned, uh, in a much a much more exciting way than uh, what I can is that we will have a lot of uh, interesting new features. Uh, so some of them we've already talked, and if you if you follow us on, on LinkedIn and, and the social uh, stuff. Um, we try to talk about a lot about the progress of everything that we're doing, uh, give give some teasers, and actually, if you're interested in testing, you know, be the first users to test the, the new things that are coming up. Uh, that's also something that's part of what we're trying to do and get better feedback and and, and iterate uh, with with the community um, to get the the best version of the new features as possible. So, Antonino uh, sends a question. So please add the grid view in the bookmark section of the model library. Would be useful for those who have a lot of models like Antonino has probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of models. <laughs> that's that's a good one. That's also a small one. Uh, we can I can safely um, promise for one of the next releases. So I'll add it to the list. All right, then have a great uh, rest of the day or night, everyone, and see you next time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.